What can a 19-year-old do for his dream of world peace? West German teenager Matthias Rust told the world that dreams must be put into action with a single flight. He flew a small single-engine plane with a 20-page manifesto, no one and no one said, single-handedly from Finland, like Don Quixote through the Iron Curtain of the Cold War. Flying 750 kilometers straight east through the anti-aircraft artillery, surface-to-air missiles, interceptors composed of Soviet air defenses, and ultimately landed in the doorway of the Kremlin, an instant on the world's hot search, but also the Soviet Union. The senior management of a cold sweat, a large number of leaders laid off for this. What did he go through along the way? Matthias Rust, a young man from Hamburg, Germany, decided that he had to do something for world peace, and in October 1986, the news of the breakdown of negotiations on the US-Soviet Arms Reduction Agreement made the young man take issue with Reagan, who believed that it was because of the instinctive distrust of the Soviet Union in the USSR, that Americans were missing out on the historic opportunity presented by the rise to power of Mikhail Gorbachev. Learning to fly, he had the idea that if he could make it to Moscow without being attacked, wouldn't that mean that the Soviet Union was no longer the evil empire that Reagan had said it was? Once the seed of a dream takes root, it naturally begins to sprout. Rust began to be tempted by the idea every day, and he prepared a 20-page essay to present to Gorbachev in person. The following spring, Rust began to carefully plan his grand scheme by modifying his rented Cessna Skyhawk 172 with an auxiliary fuel tank bringing its original range of 175 nautical miles to 750 nautical miles. In addition to his blue flower bag containing maps and flight plans, Rust had packed a motorcycle helmet, the only protective gear he could think of that might be useful in case of a forced landing. On May 13, 1987, Rust took off from Jutterson Airport outside Hamburg, and the first half of the journey was traveling, from the Faroe Islands in Denmark to Reykjavik, Iceland, Bergen, Norway, and Helsinki, Finland, traveling and flying again, letting go of his ego for half a month. The 4,200 kilometers of flight had made Rust a man-machine bond with the little plane, technically no problem. But the exciting journey had also sapped the young man's courage. 1983 Korean Air Flight 007 was shot down by the Soviets for straying into Soviet airspace, and he really wanted to risk his life to go through this hellish gate. Rust lost sleep the night of May 27. And early the next morning, as planned, he fueled his little Cessna, checked the weather, and then filed a flight plan with air traffic control for a flight to Stockholm, Sweden. The Cessna 172 took off at about 12.21 pm. After maintaining its original course for 20 minutes, Rust suddenly turned 170 degrees to the left and switched off the radio transponder. At 1 p.m., Rust's signal officially disappeared from the radar screen. The Finnish air traffic control in Tampere was very professional, immediately noticed the small aircraft disappeared from the screen, and immediately notified the Finnish Coast Guard to launch a search and rescue operation. 15 minutes later, a helicopter pilot radioed in to report that an oil slick and debris had been found in the water where Rusty disappeared, and that the Cessna was feared to be in a bad way, but at that moment Rust was alive and well, sitting in the cockpit flying his little airplane over the Soviet border as if the line didn't exist. At about 2.10 p.m. Moscow time, it took only a few minutes for a Soviet radar station in Estonia to set its sights on the ill-motivated uninvited guest, and three surface-to-air missile battalions of the 54th Defense Air Force were immediately put on alert. Rust's flight plan was simple, after entering Soviet airspace, maintain a course along the 117-degree heading, climb to an altitude of 760 meters, follow the beacons with the typical speed of flight training, all the way to Moscow Strait. This altitude is the standard cross-country altitude of the civilian small aircraft. The master is to fly so squarely without haste and without impatience, and he is strong and let him be strong. And the wind whisks the hillock. However, Rust is not stupid, finally put on the motorcycle helmet that has followed him all the way. But the controllers of the Soviet Defense Air Force were not so mindful, and they nervously watched the point of light, which had come inland, and after receiving no enemy identification signals, immediately gave it an 8255 combat alert, and two MiG-23s from the nearby Tarpa airbase rushed out to check it out. At 2.48 pm, the MiG-23 caught up with the target, and through a gap in the clouds, the pilot, Lieutenant Puchinin, saw that there was indeed a small aircraft below, but it looked as if it should be a harmless Yak-12 sport plane. And through the communication with the ground command, it was agreed that those who could fly sport planes into the sky were big shots, and it was better to not mess with them, and so the MiG-23 did not intervene to return directly to the flight. Rust in the plane had no idea what was going on, except that he noticed a large cloud ahead, and to avoid icing up the fuselage he began to drop in altitude, which cleared the radar of the Soviet Defense Air Force air traffic control, and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. It seemed that trouble always takes care of itself. 
As the weather cleared above him and rust climbed back up to 760 meters, he was already out of the previous airspace and on the radar screen of a new air defense, and the same scenario unfolded again, with a combat alert and two MiG-23s to check it out. Two hours after entering Soviet airspace, Russ saw a MiG-23 raw into view to his lower left. A fighter with a wingspan fully three times that of the smaller Cessna, which had not only unfurled its wings and lowered its flaps to fly with the slower Cessna, but had even released its landing gear, with its long nose high in the air. Rust's hair stood on end, his heart beating in his throat, was this the end of me, but the MiG pilot made no move to threaten him, and Rust later learned that the MiG had tried to contact him via radio, but military aircraft can only communicate via VHF, and could not pick up the Cessna at all when they encountered it. The two pilots, both wearing helmets, stared at each other for a minute before the MiG pilot finally gave up the call, retracted his landing gear and flaps, accelerated, and flew off. Rust Cessna had a bright West German flag affix to it, and this time it was designated not to be taken for a Yak-12, which was later analyzed and either the ground commander didn't trust the pilot's eyes or felt that the small plane was so insignificant, that it just wasn't reported and didn't leave a record in the chain of command anyway. At 3 p.m., Rust entered the Soviet Air Force training area and was in contact with training aircraft that, although military, had radar signatures similar to Cessna's. Cessna remained unidentified, but the kind commander took him for a student who had forgotten to turn on his transponder, and thoughtfully changed his radar signal from hostile to friendly with a flick of his finger. With this stroke of luck, the rest of the trip went smoother and smoother, and when he arrived in the city of Torshok, Air traffic control mistook him for a helicopter on a search and rescue operation, and once again flagged him as a friendly. And no wonder, how could such a slow-moving hostile aircraft pop up out of nowhere in the heart of the USSR? At this time, Rust was about to leave the Leningrad military district and enter the Moscow military district, and the Ring of Steel, the pride of the Soviet army, was just ahead, and it was time for comrades to show their real skills. The Soviet army's Ring of Steel built around Moscow and reinforced since the 1950s to counter the threat of American bombers, was a complex network of air defenses, from radar to missiles, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary to rust, and the flight went very smoothly. He had no trouble recognizing the landmarks on the road, and everything was in order. A little after 6 p.m., rust finally arrived at the outskirts of Moscow. This was no place for fun, as it was normally forbidden for any aircraft to fly over the capital. It was around this time that air control realized something was seriously wrong, but it was too late. After Rust flew into Moscow, he took off his helmet and started looking for Red Square. He flew from building to building. Finally he saw the unique towers around the Kremlin. At first he thought about flying directly into the Kremlin, after all, the purpose of his visit was to submit his big 20-page essay to Gorbachev, but Rust quickly dismissed the idea. If he landed within the walls, the only people who could see him would be a few people within the system. And no one would know if the KGB buried him in passing by then, so Rust decided to target his landing on the bustling Red Square. But as he circled Red Square, he realized that there were too many people in the square to land on and turned to a nearby six-lane bridge over the Moscow River, where the only obstacle was those power lines on the bridge. Rust aligned himself with the bridge, came down hard, flaps full, descended behind the first set of wires, and pulled level for a landing. The Cessna went through the last set of wires and taxied out onto Red Square. Rust slowed down and tried to park the plane in the center of the square, in front of Lenin's tomb, but a chain from St. Vasily's Cathedral was in the way, so it looked like he would have to park in front of the church. Rust shut off the engine, as if in relief and the big clock on the Kremlin clock tower showed that it was 6.43 p.m., nearly five and a half hours after takeoff from Helsinki. The crowd began to gather around, and when they realized that this West German lad, who had just accomplished the most sensational of feats, became more numerous for the people who had gathered around, coming forward to shake hands and ask for autographs. The atmosphere was festive, and an older woman even thoughtfully slipped him a piece of bread to cushion it. It didn't take long, though for the KGB to cordon off the place with soldiers, and a black sedan took Rooster away for investigation. The investigators at first just couldn't believe that this was something that had been accomplished by one man, let alone a big idealistic boy. It felt like there had to be a big conspiracy behind Rust's journey. Whether there was a conspiracy or not, I don't know, but the Cessna did trigger a major earthquake at the top of the Soviet Union, and within a few days, the Minister of Defense was forced to retire, and the head of the Air Defense Department was relieved of his duties. Over 150 people lost their jobs. On June 23, 1987, following an investigation, the Soviet Union charged Rust with illegal entry, violation of flight laws, and provocation. Rust pleaded guilty to all but the last charge. He was sentenced to four years in prison. 
However, instead of serving a grueling prison sentence, after four months in detention, Gorbachev pardoned him as a gesture of goodwill to the West. After this, Rust's flights became pop culture for a while. Moscow's Red Square got a new nickname, the Shiremetevo 3 Airport, because there were two airports in Moscow, and with Rust's antics, Red Square became an airport.